Hello, I'm Alex Lyle, the manager of the Embark Horizons Fund range. Uh, and I'm going to take a look at the funds uh, as they are today, how we see the world. But I'll start off before that with a look at performance. And uh, if you look at this slide, we can see performance since the fund was launched uh, or the fund range was launched. Uh, on the left hand side, we've got since launch, which was uh, seven years ago. And you can see from the sector rankings that all the funds uh, are in the top quartile since they've been launched. And indeed, three of them are top decile. Um, if we look over to more recent performance on the right hand side, uh, if we look at last year, the one year performance, we can see good nominal performance and again, good relative performance within their sectors. Uh, scrolling on, uh, having a look at what was good for us last year, uh, a look back at 2020, the main factors that were beneficial for us. First of all, uh, we kept faith in equities. In the depth of the dreadful bear market in spring post COVID, uh, we did a lot of analysis on the medium term outlook for equities. Uh, and we concluded that we would get through this problem. Uh, equities had thrown up good value in the bear market and it was right to stick with them. And indeed, we took the opportunity uh, to add to holdings at the lower levels. Secondly, uh, last year we favoured in particular two markets, Asia Pacific and uh, the US, and uh, they were two of the best performing uh, major regions last year. Uh, so that was very helpful. And thirdly, and very importantly, uh, we saw some excellent performance from the equity sub funds that we invest in in the different regions, uh, which um, was very much helped by uh, all the funds having a good focus on good, strong, quality companies. Uh, and that was important last year. Uh, it was a tough background for companies. So you needed strong companies with good products uh, and good balance sheets, good cash flow. And also, uh, as far as growth is concerned, there were some very important trends that were developing before COVID and COVID really accelerated those. Uh, and uh, it was very important to be on the right side of those trends, companies with the right business models and the right products for tomorrow. So that was last year. Uh, how do we see things now? Uh, we are still optimistic on equities. And there's a number of reasons I've put down here and on the next slide for that. But primarily uh, on this slide, we can see that the action by the central authorities has been crucial, um, both uh, governments and central banks. And um, if we look on the left hand side, central bank activities, first of all, central banks have adopted very loose monetary policy. Um, to start with, they took interest rates down to zero virtually everywhere. And now even the Bank of England is talking about negative interest rates, i.e. being charged for the privilege of leaving your money at the bank. Um, which I mean, they have it in Switzerland, they've had it elsewhere, uh, and it has led to uh, a big increase in people looking at the uh, option of a safe deposit box instead, just stuffing your money in there. Um, so, as I said, very low interest rates everywhere and also quantitative easing. And uh, the colourful chart on the left shows uh, central bank purchases of bonds, quantitative easing. And you can see it has been on a massive scale. This is the four major central banks of the world, much bigger than anything that was done in the uh, global financial crisis. And it was done very swiftly. So, And that's a real support for equities. Quantitative easing means that the yield on bonds comes down to very low levels because it's all brought up by central banks. Um, and therefore, investors are pushed into other assets like equity markets. Uh, on the right hand side, we can see what governments have done. Huge fiscal packages around the world uh, causing big public debt, causing big fiscal balances uh, to go negative. 
Um, but it has helped economies and that's good for companies that we invest in. Uh, and it, it's ongoing. Obviously, at the moment, there's a lot of talk about uh, Biden's proposed $1.9 trillion package, a huge package. So that's the first thing that uh, keeps us optimistic about equities, uh, central authority action, but also there's others. And if we scroll on, uh, we can see, first of all, on the, the left hand side, we've seen some very encouraging economic news, uh, that V shape. This is looking at purchasing managers indices um, around the globe, a very important indicator of what companies are doing with regard to purchasing stock. Uh, and you can see a really st steep V-shaped recovery post lockdown number one. Uh, obviously, things have uh, uh, flattened off since then, but we think we'll get another strong bounce out of uh, the current lockdowns around the globe. Uh, there's a lot of pent up demand from consumers. Uh, we all feel in need of a holiday. We all feel we want to get back to the pub um, and our savings have gone up during the lockdown. So we have got the uh, the wherewithal um, to get back to a bit of normality and enjoy ourselves again. And companies likewise have got pent up demand. They are hanging on, waiting for more certainty. Um, so we think that economies will bounce back reasonably sharply. Um, going further down the left-hand side, corporate news has been very encouraging. Companies are coming through this in good shape. Uh, this is the percentage of companies in the US current reporting season that are coming in above expectations. So over 80% of US companies reporting Q4 earnings are beating market expectations. That's very encouraging. Uh, if we go on the right hand side, the vaccine news uh, and vaccines are the game changer with uh, COVID. Once we have a high percentage vaccinated, life can start to return to normality. And we all know, you know, we've been hearing for a long time about the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. But we've got new ones coming along too. We've got the Novavax one, the J&J &J one. Um, and these, these are useful additions. The more manufacturers that have got uh, a, an efficient vaccine approved means the faster it can get rolled out and the quicker we can get back to normality. The US election has gone well. Um, we've got Biden in place, but not with a huge majority. And that does mean that he can get things done and we've talked about his $1.9 trillion package. Uh, hopefully he can introduce a better COVID policy than his predecessor. And certainly we hope he can be more diplomatic with China talks um, than his predecessor. But uh, because he's only got a wafer thin net majority in the Senate, uh, I think it'll be hard for him to introduce some of his policies, such as uh, an increase in corporation tax that he was talking about. Um, so uh, a good balance in the US, which is such an important economy for the globe. And finally, worth remembering um, that although it is a very tough world and very difficult for a lot of companies, um, there are a lot of major companies that are benefiting from the current environment. Um, and uh, I put th th that bar chart down there, bottom right hand side, that is the profit increase for some well-known uh, companies in the technology sphere, um, showing their Q4 2020 results compared to 2019, a year earlier, before COVID came along. And you can see their profits are growing at a phenomenal pace. And uh, we've got a lot of those sorts of companies in our equity portfolios. So uh, we still like equities. We think that's the, the best place to be at the moment, asset wise. Um, just one thing I wanted to touch on was growth versus value that uh, I mentioned earlier on. You can see there a slide you'll know well, um, growth and quality, the top two lines have massively outperformed value, i.e. the cheaper companies. Um, and we've certainly benefited from that. 
But do we think it's right to stick with these quality companies, which are looking expensive compared to the value ones? We think it is right because, as I said, it is a tough world. So you want strong companies. Um, and secondly, you know, I mentioned those trends that were taking place anyway, that COVID's accelerated. And there we've got an example in the, in the graph of e-commerce uh, in the UK, the, the, the top orangey line um, and the US in the lower line, huge spike upwards and it's not going to go back down again. Um, people have changed their habits and you know anything that's online, streaming, cloud computing, cashless payments, virtual meetings, gaming, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are all areas benefiting at the moment and uh, trends that we think will continue uh, and we want to stick with. But having said that, um, you know, value will have bounces every now and again. And we think we could be seeing one now, given the vaccine news, given the increased chances of economies going back to normal. Um, we are seeing a bit of a rally in more valuey stocks. And if we look at the next page, you can see we have done a few things to increase um, a bit of value and cyclicality in the portfolios uh, on a short term tactical basis. Um, from an asset allocation point of view, we've added to Japan, which is a market very geared to global growth, uh, global recovery. Um, we've also taken the UK up to neutral. We have uh, disliked it for some time. But the UK has become a very cyclical economy because it is so service orientated and its services, things like eating out, things like tourism um, that have really got hit in this uh, pandemic rather than the manufacturing side, which has done better. But we don't have much of in the UK. So UK, it's lagged. It's looking cheap compared to other markets. We think H2, our economy will actually bounce back quite sharply. So we have added there. And stock examples within different uh, regions, we've added in Europe to things like banks and airlines. In Japan, we've added to recruitment, housing, very cyclical areas. In the US, we've added to rail, building, a taxi business. Um, in emerging markets, a retail operator in Brazil. So we have just shifted the portfolios a bit, not wholesale by any means. We've still stuck with the companies we really like and believe in, but just short term added a little more value and cyclicality to the portfolios. Moving on to bonds uh, on the next slide. The bond environment is a very healthy one at the moment. We think inflation will remain low. It may pick up a bit in the short term, and we'll touch on that in a second. But deep down, we think inflation will remain low, which is good for bonds. Uh, official interest rates will stay low. Quantitative easing is going to continue. Um, there will be concerns over the economic outlook, which favours bonds. But the problem is, although the background is perfectly healthy, yields have got very low, as that chart shows you. Um, with uh, yield on 10-year government bonds in the US, the UK and Germany. Um, just 1.2 in the US, about 0.45 in the UK and a negative 0.45 in Germany. If you hold a government bond from purchase to redemption in Germany, you know you're going to lose money. Um, so value is the problem in bonds. But if we look at the next slide, uh, we can see that um, what we call credit spreads, i.e. the incremental yield you get for investing in corporate bonds as opposed to government bonds, um, we think is still perfectly reasonable. It's nothing like it, it was uh, in the bear market when it spiked up, as you can see in that chart. Um, it's back down to low levels. But we still think that's a reasonable pickup over government bonds, given the current environment, given the scope for economic recovery, and given the fact that central authorities, as part of their QE program, are buying corporate bonds. So that helps them. And governments are supporting a lot of companies 
that issue these bonds. So again, the chances of default uh, are being reduced. Just one thing I was going to touch on um, was inflation, uh, because there's a lot of talk about it at the moment, and there's certainly scope for inflation to go up a bit in the short term. Um, as I've listed there, things like capacity loss due to companies going out of business in the uh, recession, bottlenecks when things open up again. Are companies uh, going to take a bit of time to get back to normal capacity after their temporary closures? Uh, there will be increased costs from COVID, such as due to distancing, such as due to greater cleansing. Um, there will be extra Brexit costs. We've heard about the issues of borders, etc. Um, there are always increasing environmental costs, increasing regulatory costs. And companies may try and claw back profits that they've lost in the recession, although they need to be special companies with special pricing power to get away with that. Um, so we might see a bit of an increase in inflation in the short term. Uh, if we look at the chart on the right hand side, you can see inflation has actually been phenomenally stable over the last 20 years that's shown there. Uh, again for the major regions the eurozone uk and us it has been throughout that period generally between about one and two and a half percent so it's been very stable and we don't think it'll move much out of that although as i said a bit of a short-term risk but if we do see a bit of an increase it's actually quite helpful for many investments um, it favors equities over bonds and that's the way as i've said we're set up um, it, it helps companies top line their turnover. It's easier for them to nudge up prices with a bit of inflation. And importantly, at the moment, with that huge pile of, uh, of debt that governments have, it does help uh, reduce debt. Um, there's no doubt about that. But we don't expect any material increase um, over the, the medium term. Uh, and indeed, we think there will be a lot of spare capacity around, partly because a lot of people have been made redundant. But we do think there's important productivity increases to come through, which will again free up capacity. Things like uh, driverless trucks, um, driverless deliveries, uh, automation at supermarket checkouts, drone delivery, um, ordering in restaurants on an app as opposed to talking to a waitress, um, et cetera. And general automation is increasing. So uh, that should free up a lot of spare capacity and keep inflation under control. So maybe a short term increase, but nothing that we think we should worry about. So to summarize um, where we stand, our overall views on the top line there, you can see we like credit, um, i.e. corporate bonds, we like equities, we are less keen on government bonds, not much value there. Within the equity regions, we like Asia Pacific. Asia's come through with the economies in good shape. China showed 2.4% GDP last year, whereas the West is you know, going through uh, big falls in GDP. China's come through well. Taiwan saw a 3% increase in GDP last year. And there's a lot of good companies with really good growth prospects there. Things like Alibaba, Tencent in the IT world, a lot of chip manufacturers doing well, a lot of companies benefiting from growth in uh, consumer expenditure in China. Uh, Japan, uh, we've talked about, we've increased our exposure. Um, the US we like to, the economy there is in pretty good shape um, by Western standards. And again, thinking of those sort of growth areas, growth companies, a lot of the global leading players are based in the US. You don't get Alphabets, Googles, Facebooks elsewhere. Uh, UK, as I said, we brought up to neutral and neutral on emerging markets and Europe. Uh, so shifting on to finish up with, I've shown the latest uh, E-value strategic benchmarks, just for your reference. And on the next slide, I've shown where we are 
relative to those benchmarks, the tactical positions uh, Columbia Thread Needle is taking. And on the left hand side there, you can see government bonds. Um, we are underweight in corporate bonds, uh, that credit I talked about. We are above benchmark in. Uh, moving on to equities, the lighter green boxes, we are overweight overall uh, above benchmark in equities and particularly favoring the US column, um, the Japanese column and the emerging market column. It's emerging market exposure um, that we use to get our Asian exposure that I talked about. So to summarize, um, on the final slide, uh, the uh, Embark Horizon Managed Fund range, um, risk uh, targeted funds, a range of five, um, benefiting from three levels of oversight. Embark are the ACD, we've got E-value doing a lot of long-term strategic, strategic modeling of potential returns, potential risks, et cetera, and setting the strategic asset allocation and Columbia Thread Needle. Um, we are doing tactical asset allocation and active asset allocation at a stock selection level uh, to add value uh, for your clients. Uh, we invest uh, in stocks through Columbia Threadneedle funds, and that does mean using in-house funds means that you know, myself as the fund manager really understands what's in the portfolios and all those sub funds have an aligned overall macro strategy. Uh, using in-house funds keeps costs low, obviously a major concern for your clients. Um, it also means that we can be sure of effective governance we can really drill down from a risk perspective looking at uh, the funds and uh, I can be sure that there's thorough uh, ESG analysis at all levels. And finally, as we said, uh, long term performance of these funds has been excellent. So on that positive note, um, I will finish and uh, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.